I just want to encourage you this morning. Um, last couple days, I've been thinking about this place, thinking about the body. You know, I just love to be together. And uh, when I thought about this garage, it was like the Lord had spread his tent here. And so if, when you walk through the door, if you were to look up, there would be tassels along the top of his edge of his tent, and it's wide open for people to come in to partake. It's a place of security, and it's a safe place, and it's a place of invitation and honor. We get to come in, and, and he's, God is actually honoring us. And uh, I think that's beautiful. I, in my heart, it produces uh, the part, it produces a place where I want to be, I want to run into, I want to I partake. It reminds me of when the Israelites came to the mountain and it was shaking and, and God called them up to have a meal. Come and eat with me, he said. And, and the elders went up, 70 elders went up and Moses. And, but God's doing even more than that. He's saying, come and partake with me. Be under my shelter. Be under my safety. Hang on to me. Hang on to the one who can't be shaken. Hang on to the one who can't be moved, even though the world around us shakes. Even though the, all the heavens shake, I am the one that's not shakable. Hang on to me. And so that invitation's there this morning for all, for all to enter into. So come, come and partake with the Lord. His his arm is over you. His shelter is over you. And so bless you this morning. So we focus our attention back on you, Jesus. I'm standing with the rain on my face. Say 
to the fearful heart. Our God is coming. Our God is coming. And our God is here. Strengthen feeble hands. Strengthen feeble hands and steady the knees. Say to the fearful heart, our God is coming and our God is here. thing I've learned not to take for granted is that um, the belief that everything will be the same. I want to, I really want to make most of the days. I kind of, I squander most of them with distractions. That's the truth. do something that matters. I want to be a part of something that actually makes a difference. I'm not here for long. gonna break but underneath all things the everlasting arms and we don't know how much more our hearts can take underneath all things the everlasting arms Underneath all things, the everlasting arms. Underneath all things, the everlasting arms of grace. Underneath all things, the everlasting arms. And underneath it all is love and we don't know when this fiery trial will pass but underneath all things the everlasting are we don't know how much pain we've got. Oh, underneath all things, the everlasting arms. Underneath all things, the everlasting arms. Underneath all things, the everlasting arms of grace. Underneath all things, the everlasting arms. Underneath it all is love. Just when I thought my life was over, and when I felt like love was gone. 
underneath all things the everlasting arms underneath all things the everlasting arms of grace underneath all things the everlasting arms underneath it all is love underneath all things everlasting arms underneath all things the everlasting arms of grace underneath all things the everlasting arms underneath it all is love underneath underneath it all is love underneath it all love so it's the first sunday of advent glad that we get to meet together in person. It's awesome. No, come, oh, come, amen, you and ransom captive Israel. Then mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear and rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou, day spring, come and cheer. Our spirits by thine advent here Disperse the gloomy clouds of night And death's dark shadows put to flight And reach Our sad division cease and be thyself our king and peace. Rejoice, 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 rejoice. One more time. Come to thee, O Israel. 
shall come to thee, O Israel. Shall come to thee, O Israel. God created everything, the heavens above and the earth below. Then there was the voice of God. Let there be light. And light flashed, flashed into, into being. Two great lights, brighter to mark the course of day, dimmer to mark the course of night. Earth producing vegetation. Waters swarming with fish. Birds soaring in the sky. Each able to reproduce its own kind. God saw that his new creation was beautiful and good. Now, let us conceive a new creation. Humanity, made in our image, fashioned according to our likeness. And let us grant them authority over all the earth. So God did just that. He created humanity in his image, created them male and female. Then God blessed them and gave them this directive. Be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth. I make you trustees of my estate, so care for my creation and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that roams across the earth. Then God surveyed everything he had made, savoring its beauty and appreciating its goodness. Even with all that was beautiful and good, God's love demanded that his beloved creation not be an automaton, lacking choice, and so he granted mankind free will. Well handled freedom is an incredible gift, but when used with selfish intent, freedom results in chaos, pain, and darkness. And so there came the great disruption. So she plucked a fruit from the tree and ate. She then offered the fruit to her husband, and he ate as well. Suddenly, their eyes were opened to a reality previously unknown. Oh, how terrible for those who confuse good with evil, right with wrong, light with dark, and sweet with good. First time they sensed their vulnerability. Then they heard the sound of the eternal God walking in the cool, misting shadows of the garden. The man and his wife took cover among the trees and hid from the eternal God. Adam, where are you? When I heard the sound of you coming into the garden, I was afraid, so I hid from you. In the unending shadows of death's darkness, I am not overcome by fear. 
because you are with me in those dark moments. Near with your protection and guidance, I am comforted. His lamp shone above my head, and by his light, I walked through the darkness. I know the plans I have for you, plans for peace, not evil, to give you a future and hope. Never forget that. But God would not, could not leave his people in darkness, hopelessness, and lost. His love is too great. His mercy will not be limited. His compassion cannot be bound. He will send light, the living light, to restore all things to himself. The people who are now living in darkness will see a great light. They are now living in a very dark land. The virgin is going to have a baby. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He veritably glowed. He was vibrating with light. His clothes were light, white like transfiguration, like fresh A light that thrives in the depths of the darkness, blazes through murky bottoms. It cannot and will not be quenched. The true light who shines upon the heart of everyone was coming into the cosmos. In our present disruptions of flood and destruction, sickness and death, in our deep sorrow and uncertainty, in the brokenness of our world and in the darkness of our sin, we light the first candle of Advent, which is the candle of hope. And down through the ages, we hear the echoing promises of I am, who was, and is, and is to come. I will never leave you. I will always be by your side. I am the light that shines through the cosmos. If you walk with me, thrive in the nourishing light that gives life and will not know darkness. Amen. Let it be so. Let's stand.
Yes, it's a slow kingdom coming. It's a slow kingdom coming. Oh, it's a slow kingdom coming. Yes, it's a slow kingdom coming. It's coming. And it's coming. We will wait for you. We will wait for you. Just by being 
uh, sorry, just, I'm used to it now. Um, everything's just covered with mud, and it just sort of feels a little bit like we're that right now, that we're just where they're covered with the sludge and the, um, is it a sludge a word? I don't know. The, okay, the sludge of like, of life and the fears that come, right? So if that's you, just kind of lift your hands. Lord, we just, we just want to be clean. We, we just want to be just, we just want to be relaxed. Oh God, it's a little bit hard to hear you when we're anxious. Oh God, and you told us not to worry. How does that all work? Lord, would you just come and wash us all? Would you come and wash us all? Just in the midst of worship, would you come? Would you come and wash us all in Jesus' name? John BB, did I ask you to come up? I did, actually. It's implied. It's always implied. There you go. Just really, really quickly, I felt like the Lord... Like I felt in worship, maybe you felt it too, that the worship was fantastic, but I was heavy hearted. And, uh, and I was tuning into the Lord and I felt him say uh, very simply, behold, I am making all things new. Mm. And, and that just grabbed my heart. So I wanted to share that. Let's pray. You know what? Raise your hands, assume the position. Because the Lord is making all things new. Because he promised he would. And that's what he's going to do. So Lord, we just come before you in a posture of dependence. And we lift up our hands to you and we say, Lord, give us the new that we need. Come and make all things new. Lord, we let go of the old. And we receive the new that you have for us. I ask that you would pour out hope in a way that is unparalleled in our experience, Lord. That we'd be so filled with hope so filled with trust, so filled with faith, Lord, that we are, we become a little bit more unshakable. Would you do that in us, Lord? Bring the new that you have for us. Amen. Uh, so I was inspired to do this, partly because when we met as a leadership team, one of the things that we came back and affirmed was our seven values, and one of them being scripture and prayer. And it really seems like, oh my goodness, there's so much going on. And as I said in the video I, uh, that I sent out this week, I won't reiterate it all, but it seems like the Lord is really putting us through a lot of things. Um, and, uh, and if we asked for the things, for him, if we asked for stuff, it wouldn't be the same. He surprises us with it. But when that happens, we have a chance to grow. And one of the ways that we can grow is on our knees. It, and it really seems like it's time to, to come back to that foundation of prayer. Um, starting with our own personal prayer lives and then moving to corporate. So we're going to have a series in, in Advent um, on prayer. And it's one way to think about the incarnation uh, is that like, is that because of what Jesus did, we can enter the throne room. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. That's something that the Jews don't get to know about until, unless they embrace it, of course. Um, but, but it's always, it's, it's there for us. It's an ability to enter the throne room. So we, we're, we're going to do that. Matt is going to start us off, um, uh, and uh, he's going to talk about answers to prayer. And um, I'll be doing next Sunday, and I'm hoping to maybe interview some people about prayer and what they do. And, and, and we're hoping to actually try some different prayer things um, uh, next Sunday as well. So we'll be doing that on the 19th of December, uh, we're expecting to have um, a, the fa a family life, uh, a family service, uh, as we have been starting to do, one that's sort of oriented for all ages. So that's what we're going to do. You want to come on up? Yeah. Hey, did I miss something? Yeah, no, I said that, right? Did I say that? If you were listening, <laughs> Jerry Hebert. Uh, because you did tell me, yeah, you, you forgot that you did tell me about that, and that I said, uh, this is always complicated, I don't know who we're praying for at this point, is it you or them? The Holy Spirit to come. Okay. I just, and I also feel like it's a little bit of them today. Can, can you join me in praying for them? They, you think okay. they need prayer, eh? I think, it's been a heavy slog, I, okay. I think so, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I, but maybe you do too. I don't know. It's just, 
Sure. We can, we can do it all. Okay, so let's start with them, and then, we'll, then you guys pray for him, and then, we'll, and then he gets to start. Uh, so um, here we go. Yeah, God, just come and, and uh, bless our hearts. What praise do you have for them as they listen to you? What's, what's going on, man? God, I thank you that you hear me. God, I thank you that you always hear me, Lord <laughs> God. And I just pray for this group that you love, Lord God, your bridegroom. I pray that you would prepare their hearts, Lord God, to hear what your word is saying, Lord Jesus. I pray your Holy Spirit would move, that you would um, cut us to the quick, Lord God, and that we would know you and love you and fall deeper in love and deeper in understanding with you. Lord God, we just pray this in Jesus' name. We're going to give Matt a quick prayer shot. Lord, fill him. I just see the Lord touching your heart. Fill him, God. Okay, you guys ready? Here we go. Amen. Okay, well, I definitely won't need this chair. I will need this. I will need this timer because, yeah, I have... I've been in Vietnam a long time, and so we're, we sometimes get a little long-winded, but I really believe that we have a God who hears when we cry out. Amen? Amen. 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 We have a God who hears when we cry out. I love this verse. This is Isaiah 64, verse 4. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Amen. God is a God who hears. God heard Hannah. Hannah. It says that in bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and she prayed to the Lord God Almighty. And you know, the priest who is in the temple at that day, he was like, dang, this girl's drunk. She's in the temple. Ugh, awkward, what do I do here? And she pressed through it. She kept on praying. And you know what? The Lord heard her cry. She was praying for a child. She got a son. And not just any son, but this son would actually go and anoint the royal lineage of the Messiah. God is a God who hears. She actually named him Samuel, meaning God is, the, is God who hears. God heard from Egypt the cry of his people. You know, Moses didn't just show up in Egypt. Moses was, wasn't thinking about the salvation of the Jews any longer. He was thinking about sheep. But the Lord says, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out. And I'm concerned about their suffering. For I've come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians to bring them up to a land, of a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, and here's a stick. You know, if I was Moses, I would feel ripped off if the King of Kings, God Jehovah, gave me a stick. You know, like, come on, you're out of other things. You, you give me a stick to go against Pharaoh? But that's not the point. <clears throat> The point is God is a God who hears the cries of his people. He heard the cries of the Israelites that reached him um, when the Egyptians were oppressing him. And so he sent to Pharaoh Moses to bring the Israelites out. God heard a cry for the Messiah. I love it that Jesus didn't just show up on the scene. He just didn't show up and be like, okay, sort of fireworks, all that kind of stuff. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus arrived, God's salvation arrived, and, and his arrival was soaked in this long suffering prayer, sustained, expectant, faithful prayer. His, await, his arrival was long. If you have your Bibles, please open them up to Luke chapter 2. We got out of John, we got out of Dodge, we landed in Luke. Okay, so Luke chapter 2. We're looking around verse 25. So this is a story. This is actually past Christmas. Um, this is when Jesus, he's getting to be presented at the temple. And um, in verse 25, Now there is a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him 
that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Lord's anointed one, and moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. He went to the temple courts. He passed, he sort of pushed back everybody. He grabbed Jesus in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you promised, you now may dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, God's salvation, Jesus, which you have prepared in sight of all people, a light of revelation for the Gentiles and a glory for the people of Israel. Everybody was like flabbergasted. And then he kept on, he went on, and he said, this child is destined to call the falling and rising of many in Israel so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own heart too. There was also this, another lady there. She was a prophet. She was a prophetess um, from the tribe of Asher. And she was very old. I hate to say this, but this is actually a a biblical definition of uh, (coughs) being very old in the New Testament. She was 84. And this lady, she had a tough life. She was married seven years and she was widowed all the rest of uh, her days. And what she was known for was she was in the temple day and night. Day and night, fasting and praying. And I love this part because she, it says that she came up to them at that very moment. And she gave thanks and she spoke to, about the child to all who have, all who have them who are looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph, they saw this and they were astonished. Anna, she had a a PhD in long suffering. But why, why were both of these people that were filled with the Holy Spirit, why were they waiting? Why were they waiting? Why were they crying out? So it's Advent season, right? We have Advent candles, we have Advent wreaths. Christianese is a, is a funny thing. The longer you're in the church, the more you speak Christianese. Um, and the funny thing about Christianese is you say the words, but you often forget what they actually mean. Does anybody know what Advent means? Okay, Mr. Bible School. <clears throat> it means coming. It means the Lord is coming. Advent, this whole season, is about Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, that the Messiah is coming. And it was like that. Anna and Simeon, they were expecting the advent of the Messiah. They were with those looking forward to the redemption, the consolation of Israel. But why? Why now? Well, It's because God is a God who hears prayers. God is a God who who answers prayers. We we read that verse in Isaiah that there is no one has, has seen. There's no ear that has heard anybody who answers, who acts on a on account of those who wait for him. Okay, Old Testament Bible quiz. Um, who in the Old Testament was continually a troublemaker and getting into trouble because of prayer? Daniel, yes. I didn't even have to give you the hint. I love the hint. It, Daniel actually has the first scientific controlled trial ever recorded in history. Um, so Daniel. <laughs> So in Daniel, we see how important prayer is. And we see, you know, it was important enough to Daniel that it was just something he couldn't stop doing. He couldn't stop praying. He got tossed into a den of lions because his weakness was he couldn't stop praying. And we know that Daniel is famous for prayer. But the funny thing is that there's actually a lot of prayers in Daniel that we just gloss over. We sort of, the takeaway usually is, okay, prayer is good, but we forget the actual prayers of Daniel. So at the very beginning of Daniel's ministry, he got called in. Do you remember? King Nebuchadnezzar, um, I don't know if the kids are learning, they're probably not learning about this Bible's uh, story right now, but you learned it in Sunday school. 
King Nebuchadnezzar came in. He couldn't remember his dream. He demanded everybody tell him his dream and then give the, um, the revelation of the dream. And they were stuck. So Daniel came and he prayed and God gave him the, the vision and the interpretation. The book of Daniel actually has the main timing prophecies of the coming Messiah. Daniel is the only one that says, okay, the, the Messiah is going to come at this time. In the first vision, it talks about this, this statue had a head of gold, which represented Babylon, that the chest and arm was silver, which represented the Medes and the Persians. It had the belly of bronze, which represented the Greeks. It's actually literally written in Daniel that this is the progression. Babylon is going to be a kingdom. Then the Mer uh, Medes and the Persians are going to be then the Greeks are going to be a kingdom. And then the legs were iron and baked clay. And that that was going to be a kingdom. And weirdly enough, because they didn't know the name at the time, they said the other kingdom. And, and that was the Roman kingdom. And then there was going to be a rock that was not hewn by human hands and it was going to destroy this and it was going to fill the entire earth and it was going to last forever and ever. This rock not, not cut by human hands, this kingdom, this heavenly kingdom, that's what it meant when it meant this rock not cut by human hands was going to fill the earth and it was going to be for all generations. We talked about, we talked about this before, but Jesus again and again, he reminded us about that psalm, that song of salvation. Um, we call it Psalm 118. And in that, it has that, that promise that the stone that the builder rejected has become the capstone, and it is marvelous in our eyes. So Jesus is that stone in that prophecy. Jesus starts that kingdom of heaven that fills the whole earth. And Jesus also chose people too. And he looked at one, and he said, you know what? Your name isn't Simon anymore. Your name is the rock, Petros. And I'm going to build my church on you. I love this. This is Daniel uh, 7.27. And the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. All dominion shall serve and obey him. Amen? I read this and I go, wow, I could see Paul writing this. But this is Old Testament talking about the kingdom of heaven. God is a God who hears. Amen? Okay, so it talked about Daniel, one of Daniel's prophecies was the political climate when the kingdom of heaven was coming. Secondly, it was, it was actually this timing of when the kingdom of heaven was going to come. Um, the problem, I don't know if you've ever read Daniel all the way through. Hopefully you have. But if you read Daniel all the way through, it's really easy to get lost. Like, I don't know if you're... If you're like me, it's really easy to get lost. And so Daniel, Daniel actually cried out to the Lord. He, it said that he put on sackcloth and ashes because he didn't understand what God was trying to tell him. And he cried out and an angel showed up. God heard Daniel's cries and an angel showed up. And this angel gave him the biggest prophecy about the coming of Advent, the coming of the Messiah. This angel said that there would be about 483 years from the decree that the exiles were allowed to re return and rebuild Jerusalem to when the Messiah was coming. Old Testament uh, quiz number two. Uh, who, who is famous for, being, um, for rebuilding Jerusalem? Ezra, Nehemiah. My dad, he was, he was a joker. <coughs> He's, he would say, who's the shortest person in the Bible? Nehemiah. <laughs> oh, yes. The shoe height. You're right. Sorry, Tom. That is, that is next level. That is next level dad joke. Bible dad joke. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Grandpa joke. There you go. And it's actually amazing because in Nehemiah, uh, the second chapter, it actually said that he received this decree um, in the 20th year of uh, Artaxerxes. And, you know, okay, I, 
Off the top of my head, I don't know what the 20th year of uh, Artaxerxes is, but that's been found out, um, and that was about 450 BC. So the clock started ticking. This prophecy, this 483 uh, years, started ticking at 445 BC. Wow. So that is why about 450 years later, Anna and Simeon were waiting for the consolation of Israel. That's why they were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem when God made all things right. The countdown started in Nehemiah with the exiles. And it was going to end with the Messiah and with the end of the temple and the end of sacrifice. Wow. So not only is God a God who hears, he's a God who has a long haul vision for his coming. He has a long haul Emmanuel vision. Okay, Christmas pop quiz. I th okay, I'll just stand. Christmas pop quiz. Who is famous for knowing the timing of the advent, the timing of the king of the Jews? The wise men. Okay. It's actually, it's actually funny because um, we call them wise, wise men. Um, in, in Vietnamese, it's wise, wise men are, are often doctors. So in the Vietnamese translation, the older translation of the Bible, it was the three doctors came. Um, and so these three doctors, they came and they asked Herod, okay, who is the king of the Jews? And Herod's like, right. Um, he's like, I don't know. He's like, does anybody know where the Messiah is supposed to be born? And, and they're like, oh, yeah, Bethlehem. He's like, okay, yeah, Bethlehem. He's like, by the way, what exact time did this, uh, did this star show up? What exact time should we be expecting this, um, this Messiah, this King of Kings, uh, King of the Jews? The word is not doctors. The word is not wise men. It's the magi. Who the heck were Magi? Well, when they were translating the Bible, um, you know, way back when, Old King James Version, they, they didn't have all of, the, all of the knowledge that we have. So it was sort of like, if you just said the Magi, people would be like, I don't know who the Magi are. Sure, we'll call them, um, we'll call them wise men, because yeah, they, they knew something. Who were the Magi? Well, believe it or not, this is in Iran. Um, this is the Behistun uh, inscription. That is about 300 feet up, up on a solid, uh, or on a sheer cliff face. This is kind of like the Rosetta Stone of ancient coniform, uh, which was the ba Babylonian writing with those little squiggles. That is actually Darius the Great. He's the, that guy standing up there. And in the inscription, he's actually standing, see that unfortunate guy under uh, uh, Darius the Great's foot? That is actually the leader of the Magi people. So the Magi, they lived in Babylon and they were famous for dream interpretation. They were famous for prophecy. They were famous for actually making kings. When King Cyrus became king, he was actually, um, he was actually foretold by the Magi. The, the father of um, uh, a sort of ancient Greek history is this guy named Herodotus, and he actually wrote about the Magi being famous for dream, um, dream interpretation, for uh, astrology, and for anointing kings. So the Magi weren't just doctors, they weren't just wise people. They were famous for making kings, they were famous for looking at the stars. But it actually gets a little bit worse. So there was actually a guy that we were talking about who was in Babylon, who was famous for dream interpretation, and who Nebuchadnezzar himself put in charge of the magicians. That's where we get our word, the magi. The word magi actually turned into magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So when you read about the three wise men coming to Bethlehem, you know what? That actually started back in Daniel's day. Daniel, when he put the timing of the whole advent, 
when he saw the vision of when the Messiah was going to come, when he was interpreting all these dreams, and when he was put in charge of this group of people that were the, the magicians, the, um, the diviners, the, the dream interpreters, that is God's long haul plan. God, that is God's long vision of Emmanuel. But wait, God's not finished. Okay, remember that angel that came and, and gave that prophecy to Daniel. Does anybody know who that angel's name was? Gabriel. Wow. Gabriel shows up three times in the Bible. One is to give the timing of the Messiah to Daniel. The second is to prepare the way. Gabriel went to Zechariah, and uh, the first thing he says to Zechariah, he's like, do not be afraid. God has, uh, your prayers have been heard. Do not be afraid. God is a God who hears pr your cry. They, they had been crying out for a child, uh, but they were barren. So, um, and then Gabriel, uh, Gabriel, Gabe says to Zach, he's like, your boy is going to prepare the way of the Lord and the Messiah. No, it says, I will go, um, your son will go before the Lord the spirit and power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make people prepared for the Lord. And, and I love this. Um, and Gabriel says to him, sort of like, by the way, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you to tell you the good news. And um, so Gabriel is sent to give the timing of the Messiah. Gabriel is sent to send the, uh, the prophesied messenger to go in front of the Messiah. And then God is sent to Mary. Gabriel tells, him, uh, tells Mary that uh, she would give birth to his son and that you are to call him Jesus, which means God's salvation. You are to call him Jesus, uh, and he will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will, um, will give him the throne of his father, David. Remember, way back when, there, we had this, a, a literal person named God Hears. We started with the story of Samuel. We, we have this promise that Gabriel is saying that, oh, you remember that, that person that Samuel anointed to become king? Your son is going to sit has that on the throne, on that royal lineage. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Just like that rock that always expands, takes up, fills up the whole earth, his kingdom will never end. Wow. So that is why there was this expectation. Israel was expecting this Messiah. Anna and Simeon were expecting this, this Messiah. Personally, in my own life, sometimes God takes longer than you would like. Sometimes you have to sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. God, please intervene in my situation. God, I need you to help me here. In Vietnam, I, there was, this was about three years ago, I'd, I'd gone to a wedding and, you know, it was, I'm not really sure why, but um, a friend in my church was like, hey, can you come to my wedding and can you film it? And I am, I'm, not a, I'm not a wedding photographer or a filmer or anything like that. And so I was like, sure, I'll, I'll help you out at your wedding. So we, we drove like about four, about four hours and uh, we went to this wedding. And to tell you the truth, um, I, I was just sort of, you know, praying and all that kind of stuff, uh, as you do. And there was actually a man in a wheelchair. And um, I felt like God said, go pray for him. And so I went and I, I said, hey, you know, my name is Ming Tang. And I, I believe that God hears and answers prayers. Can I, can I pray for your leg? And he was like, sure, you can, you can pray for my leg. And so I got down, I, I prayed for his leg. And nothing happened. And I didn't actually really even think about that, uh, that situation for a very long time. I went home, I went back to Hanoi, 
and um, I'd been involved with translating the Youth Alpha into Vietnamese, and when we were finished, we actually got to start this wonderful church plant. I, I'd specifically chosen to live in a, like a rough part of town, and uh, my friends and I were like, oh, we'd love to plant a church here. So we, we did the, this Youth Alpha, and there was about 16 people who became Christians. Um, and so they were, they were mostly gangsters, um, so, you know, you work with what you got. Uh, and uh, in, in Vietnam, if you're, if you're a gangster, it's funny, it, the words are the same in English um, and in Vietnamese, but you actually look quite different. So in Vietnamese, if you're a gangster, you are scrawny. You are scrawny, and you have dragon tattoos all over, because that's, that's uh, you're scrawny because you've been, you know, chain smoking since you were 12, and you have dragon tattoos because that's what you do. Um, and so I just have so many wonderful experiences of, of being in this like small little room with these 16 guys. We'd actually take off our, sh our shirts because it was like 45 degrees and 100% humidity and we'd just like sweat and worship the Lord and it was wonderful. But like all good things, they do come to an end so our, our like, like shirtless uh, worship fest uh, ended. Um, we, we got a little bit more respectable. Uh, there was one guy who became, who, he had become a Christian and he just got a hold of the gospel. Uh, he started his own, actually a, a gold business. Um, yeah, uh, my wedding room is actually, he made it. Um, and uh, he, one of, he hired this guy. This guy was like, oh, what are you doing on the weekend? And he's like, oh, I'm going to, this house church. So he came to our house church. He became a Christian. He invited um, this this gal who knew him to come to our, our house church too. Her name is Bay. And um, so Bay was this like really quite quiet, quite timid person when she first came. And then she accepted the Lord into her life and her life just radically changed. And she actually... She was doing our home, our home church, and she was also actually starting to lead uh, the youth or the uh, children's ministry in this uh, registered uh, church too. And so, the problem in Vietnam is if you become a Christian, especially if in North Vietnam, it's actually really hard for you uh, because in the northern part of Vietnam, you're supposed to you everybody has an ancestral shrine, and you have to. Um, you have to give offerings to your ancestors and you have to, um, you put out food actually for your ancestors and then um, then you eat it. And there actually are some um, like seances are, are fairly common. Uh, even in the secular community, they're like, they're like, oh yeah, I've seen my, my aunt invite my, my grandfather's spirit in and writhe on the ground. And, and, and like secular people say this. So the problem is when you become a Christian, you kind of have to cut some of those ties. And when you cut some of those ties, then your, your family are like, oh, you are, you are uh, not honoring our ancestors. You are turning your back on your family. So it's really tough. And so anyway, we were all praying for Bay. She, uh, she went back to her hometown. And, um, and her parents actually started giving her a real hard time. And Bay, um, but the Holy Spirit prompted her to pray. And the Holy Spirit specifically prompted her to pray for her grandfather. And she said, Grandfather, what would you like prayer for? And, and her grandfather said, Please pray for my leg. And so she knelt down beside his wheelchair. And she prayed. And while she was praying, she said, she felt like the Holy Spirit nudge her and say, no, your grandfather has to have faith too. And she said, grandfather, stand up. And he stood up and he shouted and he ran and everybody in the house came and saw him. And he said, I've never seen or heard anything like this that your God can hear and answer prayers. He's like, where, where did you hear about this God who hears and answers prayer? And she told about her little house church. And a, 
uh, an unassuming Canadian guy who was serving the Lord there. And he was like, wow, three years ago, an unassuming Canadian guy prayed for me. Sometimes God is playing the long game. You know, the Bible says that the Lord is not sh slow in keeping his promises. The Lord is actually not wanting anybody to perish. God has an Emmanuel plan for your life. God has an Emmanuel plan that sometimes takes longer than we're anticipating, but God has a plan. Hi, nephews. I guess that means I'm, I'm going over my time. Uh, but, okay. Uh, Scotty would be very disappointed in me unless I got some application happening. So, um, <laughs> So just, just to like reiterate what we've learned, God is a God who answers prayer. God is a God who, is, um, who is, uh, maybe has a long-term um, uh, Emmanuel plan for our lives. And so and our application is that we need to be watchful in prayer. We need to cry out. So our, um, our application actually comes from Anna and Simeon first. Just like in Egypt, cry out to the Lord. If you have problems, pray continually. Continually ask for God's presence to be in whatever situation you are in. You know, sometimes you need a miracle in your lives, and that is good, because we have a miracle-working God. Anna was day and night in the temple, worshiping, fasting, praying. Being watchful in prayer. When you're praying for Emmanuel, when you're praying for God to come into your life, you actually have to know that God is the best thing that can happen to your life. He doesn't just want the best thing for you, He is the best thing for you. And sometimes we forget that, and prayer reminds us of that. So pray continually, day and night. Stand on His promises. Simeon stand, stood on that personal promise that he was going to see the Messiah. Anna stood on that promise that she was going to see the redemption of Jerusalem. Stand on those promises. Stand on those specific long-term Daniel Advent promises. And being ready for Advent, being ready for God's Emmanuel moment is instant obedience. We actually don't know if he was like a, a priest or like traditionally like the paintings have him as a priest, but we don't actually know. We don't know if he was just a righteous and devout man who was about his activities and the Holy Spirit nudged him to go to the, um, the temple. But when the Holy Spirit nudged him, he moved instantly. There was instant obedience. Same thing with Anna. I love it that it says Anna came at that very moment. Instant obedience. So just to recap, our God hears. Sometimes there's a long haul, Advent, Emmanuel plan in our lives, and we have to be ready in prayer. Application, ready in prayer means we pray continually. We stand on God's promises, and we're there with instant obedience. I don't know how you want to finish this off. I don't know if anybody here was feeling like a tug of the Holy Spirit, and they just need either a, a real Emmanuel moment, God coming coming and meeting them right here on earth right now or if you've been in a, a time where you've cried out for a long time and you're and you just need a refreshing of the Holy Spirit I believe that that God is here for that for you here today and um, yeah do you have anything yeah too I just uh That's a word we all want to hear. So, um, I, I, and I really believe that we are a people of prayer. We are all people. We are people who persevered in prayer. But I also really believe that God is calling us to more. You know, and Matt's story of uh, of the grandfather, like that, we we need to hold that in our hearts and just um, and just remember that. If you're comfortable with it, just open your hands.
God, we thank you for your coming. Lord God, we thank you for your arrival. We thank you that you promised, Lord God, that that we are your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. God, I thank you that you are doing a good work in each and every one of us, Lord God, and that you will carry it on to completion. So God, we just say, come, O come, Emmanuel. Come, O come, Lord, with us. Fill every part of our lives, Lord God. More of you and less of us, Lord Jesus. God, I pray for those people who are, are, have been praying for, for promises that have been a long time in coming. God, I thank you yeah. That, yeah. that you're not just being lazy, God, but that you have something very specific planned. So Jesus, I just speak uh, renewed hope, renewed life. God, I thank you that this is the, the advent of hope this week, Lord God. I pray that you would renew that sense of expectancy of what you can do in our lives, God, that you would renew that, expe- uh, that sense of expectancy, what you can do in this church, and Lord God, what your Holy Spirit can do with five loaves of bread and two fish, Lord God. I thank you that we we give you whatever we have and that you God, we thank you. We pray for your consolation of everybody here in our, in our group, Lord God, in the Abbotsford Vineyard. Lord Jesus, we pray for the redemption of this group, that you make all things good. We thank you that you have prepared a way for us, Lord God, and that you love to do that. That the stone that the builder rejected became the capstone. And why did you do that? Because it was marvelous. It is marvelous in our just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think we're done yet. I want to remind you, though, of the rule that, like, hey, if it, it's it's at 12. Like, if you guys need to go, go, please. Um, we don't want to hold anybody here. But for those of you who can stay, I actually feel like we need to wait a little bit. I feel, I feel like if, if you can stay and wait on the Lord a little bit, then do with us. Because that was, that was part of what we just heard, right? Sometimes he's in for the long haul. And we have difficulty hanging in there for five minutes. So let's just see if we can just wait a little bit on the Lord um, and just let him bless us. Keep, your, uh, keep your, the mi- your, your mind's eye open for what he seems to be doing in you. Um, Thank you, Lord. And just let him minister to you. It's going to be the rustle of people who need to go. And our job is just to let that happen and acknowledge the goodness of the Lord. Yeah, just let the softness of the Lord come in and just rest in your soul. Holy Spirit, come. We say that you are good. In the midst of flood and chaos, Lord, we say that you are good. Just try to just keep yourselves open to what the Spirit may be teaching you and showing you even now. If your mind wanders off, just just bring it back to, to well, what's the Lord saying? 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 If you think you've got something from the Lord for us, Give me a little wave. You can do that now or...
I feel like the Lord just wants to speak peace over all of us. I want to point out that we did a 40-day fast in the midst of a drought. Do you remember? Do you remember the drought? Do you remember the drought? We did a 40, and then what happened is halfway through the fast, we had rain, and we were thirsty for that rain. And then I never pointed this out here, but and then at the end of the fast, again we had rain, rain that we needed, and now we have a flood. And I'm not sure, and I'm very nervous about saying this kind of thing ever, but I really do think he wants to come in like a flood. I do, I do think he's responding to us and he wants to come in. And I think one of the things he's asking us is, are you ready for me? Because I'm coming, but I'll only come to hearts that will receive me because I'm, a, I'm nice that way. I don't come and break down the door unless there's intercessors demanding that I do or asking, begging that I do. So I come and I come to the doors that are open. And I really do think he's saying, hey, is that AVC? Because I am coming. Will it, be, will it be you? I would like it. I think he's saying this. I would like it to be you. I've prepared you. So will it be you? And I think as I said earlier this week, I think he's prayed for us that we would make it through this time. So it's not a whole lot of works or something we have to steam up or whatever. It's simply an opening that we have to do. I think it might take some time. So let's just wait another minute. One of the things that the Lord does in the end of the Gospel of John is he is after he rises from the dead, he blows on his people. And when he blows on his disciples, he says, be filled with the Spirit. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. But my peace I give you. And so you're, if you're comfortable with it, just imagine him blowing on you now and saying, be filled with the Spirit. You're welcome to stay in that posture for as long as you like. Um, maybe encourage Travis if you could keep on playing a little bit. Oh, we have a word. Okay. Um, when uh, Travis was singing earlier, um, is it the slowness of the kingdom? Is that how that went? Um, a while ago, God gave me a scripture, and today when, when Travis was singing that, he reminded me of that, and then Matt shared it when he was, when he was speaking. And it is the, the one out of 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord isn't, isn't really slow, being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want any to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So God is not being slow. I have to remind myself of that all the time. We live in a time where we are an impatient bunch. We want instant. We want now. I think God is just reminding us that he is not being slow. His timing is never wrong. Mike's yours, Mike. The mic's yours. I've been um, pondering and praying about how 
God would want me to pray about the rain. And like, you know, we know that this, the physical is always connected to the spiritual. And so what are you saying, Lord? What are you saying about what you want to do here? And um, today we've heard Mike say about, you know, God wanting to, to come and basically pour out his blessings on us like a flood. And yet floods are destructive. And we, as we have seen, when we're not ready for them, it causes a lot of destruction. And I do believe God wants to pour out his goodness. And I've, I've been aware that he wants to do that for, for quite a while. And um, like for some years. And I've seen and I've known that we are not prepared for the flood that he wants, to, a flood of goodness that he wants to, to pour on us. And, um, and we see in the natural that we have not been prepared for the flood, a flood. And I, I really believe that, and this morning I, I got this revelation. Um, and let me back up a little bit, okay? I believe as his sons and daughters, and we heard that this morning, we are to have authority, to step into authority, and to subdue the earth. Now, that might have a negative connotation to, to some people. But we are to take care of the earth. And when the rain is pouring down, two months' worth of rain in two days, that I think we can do something about that as sons and daughters. And we can look at that and say, okay, you know, what, what is the good thing? What is the right thing? You know, we want to have understanding and not pray for something that is going to have devastating effects, but we want to have understanding in how to command to step into authority and command the earth as we're supposed to. And I really believe this morning that we have an opportunity to pray together that the rain would not stop, but that it would slow down. That's the word that I have this morning, is that we would agree to pray. Now, I want you to engage in that and 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 check your spirit, check the Holy Spirit, if that seems right. But I submit that to you. Um, and I just want us to wait together and see if there's an agreement about praying that way for the rain. Because it's supposed to keep coming down. It's supposed to be on Tuesday, right? It's supposed to come down even more. And in my spirit, I really feel it is right but I wanted to submit it to you all um, to pray that it would slow down and, and that we as a, a community in the valley and with the U.S., we need to prepare for, for the floods because this is, this is something that is predicted to keep going, keep happening. Um, so we need to prepare, but also we need to prepare for, for God's move that he wants to do his floods of flood of goodness and so we want to be in agreement and pray that the, the body of Christ would be um, prepared for the goodness of God and I believe that the goodness of God is salvation of renewed minds and renewed hearts so that's what I submit today So I just want to ask right now, what what is what are you guys sensing? What are you hearing? Okay. That it would slow down? 
Okay. Well, that's awesome. Okay, I just think there's a lot of power when we can come together in agreement and pray, pray the same thing. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're speaking. Thank you for your good news, Lord. Thank you for your promises. And that you hear us. And that you are patient. And I thank you that what you have been speaking to us about slowing down the rain. And so together we just, we agree that the rain would slow down. And we speak to that river in the sky to slow down. Slow down your release. We're not cutting you off. We're just saying slow down. In the name of Yeshua, we stand. We step into our place of authority. And we're taking responsibility today. Together. Because the kingdom of God comes through us, partnering with God. Waiting on him to see what he's doing and then partnering and doing with you. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And forgive us, Lord, for when we have not taken responsibility. just waiting for something to happen. This is a new day. This is a new day. And your mercies are new every day. Your grace is new every day. And so we ask, Lord, for your grace to be upon us, to take responsibility for what's going on around us in our brothers' and sisters' lives and in the earth. Thank you, Lord. You are good. And may your goodness flow through us into our community. May your love pour through the streets instead of grime and, and filth. May your love flow through the streets. Thank you, Lord, the army of love. Hallelujah. And everybody said, amen. Wow. I do, I do, I know that feels like we're done. I actually thought there was one more word. I did. So I'm just going to check. Aha. Uh -huh. Here it is. I wasn't sure because I'm having trouble sorting it out. But um, David's poem, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the words valley, which is deep places that we go through, shadow, dark places, death. Some of us have experienced death of loved ones this week. Um, death is destruction. My kids living in Sumas, they've experienced a lot of destruction. But I will fear no evil. And we have to remind ourselves, even when we're facing all of these hardships as we endure in this season of the kingdom now and not yet, that we have to keep our eyes on the light, on the life, and that protects us from the fear of evil. It's so easy to look at everything going on around us. We have to discipline ourselves to look to the one who promises hope and life and salvation and deliverance. And even we're in, we're in the season of it doesn't seem to be yet. Just keep looking, keep praying, keep reaching, keep
keep reminding yourself, keep reminding each other that God is good. He is good all the time. And his goodness will be revealed. And I feel that's a, a word for some of us that are going through hard times. But there's also a word for Abbotsford Vineyard in that. Though I walk through the valley, there's a song by Cademan's Call that reminds us that valleys fill first. And Abbotsford Vineyard's gone through a valley these past through two years. Valleys fill first. God will fill us in his time. Go in peace. See you back here next week.